Chapter Eleven of Prejudice's First Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prejudice's First Series by H. L. Mencken. Chapter Eleven. Six Members of the Institute. One. The Boudoir Balzac. The late Percival Pollard was, in my nonage, one of my enthusiasms, and later on, one of my friends. How as a youngster I used to lie in wait for the criterion every week and devour Pollard, Hunnaker, Meltzer, and Vance Thompson. That was in the glorious middle nineties, and savory pots were brewing. Scarcely a week went by without a new magazine of some unearthly tendons or other appearing on the stands. Scarcely a month failed to bring forth its new genius. Pollard was up to his hips in the movement. He had a hand for every debutante. He knew everything that was going on. Polyglot, Catholic, generous, alert, persuasive, forever oscillating between New York and Paris, London and Berlin, he probably covered a greater territory in the one art of letters than Hunnaker covered in all seven. He worked so hard as introducer of intellectual ambassadors, in fact, that he never had time to write his own books. One very brilliant volume, Masks and Minstrels of New Germany, adequately represents him. The rest of his criticism, clumsily dragged from the files of the Criterion and Town Topics, is thrown together ineptly in Their Day in Court. Death sneaked upon him from behind. He was gone before he could get his affairs in order. I shall never forget his funeral, no doubt a fit finish for a critic. Not one of the authors he had whooped and battled for was present. Not one, that is, save old Ambrose Bierce. Bierce came in an elegant plug hat and told me some curious anecdotes on the way to the crematory, chiefly of morgues, dissecting rooms, and lonely churchyards. He was the most gruesome of men. A week later, on a dark, sleety Christmas morning, I returned to the crematory, got the ashes, and shipped them west. Pollard awaits the second coming of his Redeemer in Iowa, hard by the birthplace of Professor Dr. Stuart P. Sherman. Well, let us not repine. Hunnaker lives in Flatbush and was born in Philadelphia. Cabell is a citizen of Richmond, Virginia. Willis Siebert Cather was once one of the editors of McClure's magazine. Dreiser, before his enunciation, edited dime novels for Street and Smith, and will be attended by a Methodist friar, I dare say, on the gallows. Pollard, as I say, was a man I respected. He knew a great deal. Half English, half German, and wholly cosmopolitan, he brought valuable knowledges and enthusiasms to the developing American literature of his time. Moreover, I had affection for him as well as respect, for he was a capital companion at the Beertisch and was never too busy to waste a lecture on my lone ear, say on Otto Julius Beerbohm, one of his friends, or Anatoly France, or the technique of the novel, or the scoundrelism of publishers. It thus pains me to violate his tomb, but let his shade forgive me as it hopes to be forgiven. For it was Pollard, I believe, who set going the doctrine that Robert W. Chambers is a man of talent. A bit too commercial, perhaps, but still fundamentally a man of talent. You will find it argued at length in their day in court. There Pollard called the role of the promising young men of the time circa 1908. They were Winston Churchill, David Graham Phillips, and Chambers. Alas for all the prophets and their prognostications, Phillips, with occasional reversions to honest work, devoted most of his later days to sensational serials for the train boy magazines, and when he died his desk turned out to be full of them, and they kept dribbling along for three or four years. Churchill, seduced by the uplift, has become an evangelist and a bore, a worse case even than that of H. G. Wells. And Chambers? Let the New York Times answer. Here, in all sobriety, is its description of the heroine of the Moonlit Way, one of his latest pieces. She is a lovely and fascinating dancer who before the war held the attention of all Europe and incited a great many men who had nothing better to do to fall in love with her. She bursts upon the astonished gaze of several of the important characters of the story when she dashes into the ballroom of the German embassy, standing upon a bridled ostrich, which she compels to dance and go through its paces at her command. She is dressed, Mr. Chambers assured us, in nothing but the skin of her virtuous youth, 
modified slightly by a yashmak and a zone of blue jewels about her hips and waist. The italics are mine. I wonder what poor Pollard would think of it. He saw the shoddiness in chambers, the leaning toward profitable pot-boiling, but he saw to a fundamental earnestness and a high degree of skill. What has become of these things? Are they visible even as ghosts in the preposterous serials that engod the magazines of Mr. Hurst, and then load the department stores as books? Were they, in fact, ever there at all? Did Pollard observe them, or did he merely imagine them? I am inclined to think that he merely imagined him, that his delight in what he described as many admirable tricks led him into a fatuity that he now has an eternity to regret. Chambers grows sillier and sillier, emptier and emptier, worse and worse. But was he ever more than a fifth raider? I doubt it. Let us go back half a dozen years to the days before the war forced the pot boiler down into utter imbecility. I choose at random the gay rebellion. Here is a specimen of the dialogue. It startled me. How did I know what it might have been? It might have been a bear, or a cow. You talk, said Sayer angrily, like William Dean Howells. Haven't you any romance in you? Not what you call romance. Pass the flapjacks. Sayer passed them. My attention, he said, instantly became riveted upon the bushes. I strove to pierce them with a piercing glance. Suddenly, sure, suddenly always comes next. Suddenly the leaves were stealthily parted, and a naked savage in full war paint. Naked nothing, a young girl in a perfectly fitting gown stepped noiselessly out. Out of what, you gink? The bushes, damn it, she looked at me, I gazed at her. Somehow, in plainer terms, she gave you the eye. What? That's a particularly coarse observation. Then tell it your own way. I will. The sunlight fell softly upon the trees of the ancient wood. Wouldn't that bark you? And so on and so on for page after page. Can you imagine more idiotic stuff? Pierce and piercing, you gink. She gave you the eye. Wouldn't that bark you? One is reminded of horrible things, the repartees of gas-house comedians in vaudeville, the whimsical editorials in life, the forbidding gooleries of Irvin Cobb among jokes pale and clammy in death. But let us, you may say, go back a bit further, back to the days of the chapbook. There was then, perhaps, a far different Chambers, a fellow of sound talent and artistic self-respect, well deserving the confidence and encouragement of Pollard. Was there indeed? If you think so, go read The King in Yellow, circa 1895, if you can. I myself, full of hope, have tried it. In it I have found drivel almost as dull as that, say, in Ailsa Page. 2. A Stranger on Parnassus The case of Hamlin Garland belongs to pathos in the grand manner, as you will discover on reading his autobiography, A Son of the Middle Border. What ails him is a vision of beauty a seductive strain of body music over the hills. He is a sort of male Mary MacLean, but without either Mary's capacity for picturesque blasphemy or her skill at plain English. The vision in his youth tore him from his prairie plough and set him to clawing the anthills at the foot of Parnassus. He became an elocutionist, what in modern times would be called a Chautauquan. He aspired to write for the Atlantic Monthly. He fell under the spell of the Boston Illuminados of 1885, which is as if one were to take fire from a June bug. Finally, after embracing the single tax, he achieved a couple of depressing storybooks, earnest, honest, and full of indignation. American criticism, which always mistakes a poignant document for aesthetic form and organization, greeted these moral volumes as works of art, and so Garland found himself an accepted artist and has made shift to be an artist ever since. No more grotesque miscasting of a diligent and worthy man is recorded in profane history. He has no more feeling for the intrinsic dignity of beauty, no more comprehension of it as a thing in itself than a policeman. He is and always has been a moralist endeavoring ineptly to translate his messianic passion into aesthetic terms, and always failing. A Son of the Middle Border, undoubtedly the best of all his books, projects his failure brilliantly. It is in substance a document of considerable value, 
a naive and often highly illuminating contribution to the history of the American peasantry. It is in form a thoroughly third-rate piece of writing, amateurish, flat, banal, repellent. Garland gets facts into it. He gets the relentless sincerity of the rustic Puritan. He gets a sort of evangelical passion. But he doesn't get any charm. He doesn't get any beauty. In such a career as in such a book there is something profoundly pathetic. One follows the progress of the man with a constant sense that he is steering by faulty compasses, that fate is leading him into paths too steep and rocky, nay, too dark and lovely for him. An awareness of beauty is there, and a wistful desire to embrace it. But the confident gusto of the artist is always lacking. What one encounters in its place is the enthusiasm of the pedagogue, the desire to yank the world up to the soaring Methodist level, the hot yearning to displace old ideas with new ideas, and usually much worse ideas. For example, the single tax and spook chasing. The natural goal of the man was the evangelical stump. He was led astray when those Boston Brahmins of the last generation, enchanted by his sophomoric platitudes about Shakespeare, set him up as a critic of the arts, and then as an imaginative artist. He should have gone back to the Saleratus belt, taken to the Chautauquas, preached his foreordained perunas, got himself into Congress, and so helped to save the Republic from the demons that beset it. What a gladiator he would have made against the plunderbund, the white slave traffic, the rum demon, the Kaiser. What a rival to the Honorable Claude Kitchen, the Reverend Dr. Newell Dwight Hillis. His worst work, I dare say, is in some of his fiction, for example in The Forester's Daughter. But my own favorite among his books is The Shadow World, a record of his communings with the gaseous precipitates of the departed. He takes great pains at the start to assure us that he is a man of alert intelligence and without prejudices or superstitions. He has no patience, it appears, with those idiots who swallow the buffooneries of spiritualist mediums too greedily. For him the scientific method, the method which examines all evidence cynically and keeps on doubting until the accumulated proof, piled mountain high, sweeps down in an overwhelming avalanche. Thus he proceeds to the haunted chamber and begins his dalliance with the banshees. They touch him with clammy spectral hands. They ring music for him out of locked pianos. They throw heavy tables about the room. They give him messages from the golden shore and make him the butt of their coarse transcendental humor. Through it all he sits tightly and solemnly, his mind open and his verdict up his sleeve. He is belligerently agnostic and calls attention to it proudly. Then in the end he gives himself away. One of his fellow scientists, more frankly credulous, expresses the belief that real scientists will soon prove the existence of spooks. I hope they will, says the agnostic Mr. Garland. Well, let us not laugh. The believing mind is a curious thing. It must absorb its endless rations of balderdash or perish. A son of the middle border is less amusing, but a good deal more respectable. It is an honest book. There is some bragging in it, of course, but not too much. It tells an interesting story. It radiates hard effort and earnest purpose. But what a devastating exposure of a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. 3. A Merchant of Mush Henry Sidnor Harrison is thoroughly American to this extent, that his work is a bad imitation of something English. Find me a second-rate American in any of the arts, and I'll find you his master and prototype among third, fourth, or fifth-rate Englishmen. In the present case the model is obviously W.J. Locke, but between master and disciple there is a great gap. Locke at his high points is a man of very palpable merit. He has humor. He has ingenuity. He has a keen eye for the pathos that so often lies in the absurd. I can discover no sign of any of these things in Harrison's 100,000 word Christmas cards. They are simply sentimental bosh, huge gumdrops for fat women to snuffle over. Locke's grotesque and often extremely amusing characters are missing. In place of them there are the heroic cripples, silent lovers, maudlin war veterans, and angelic grandams of the old-time Sunday school books. The people of V.V.'s eyes are preposterous, and the thesis is too silly to be stated in plain words. No sane person would believe it if it were put into an affidavit. Queed is simply Locke, diluted with vast drafts from Laddie and Pollyanna. Queed himself, long before the end, becomes a marionette without a toe on the ground. 
His Charlotte is incredible from the start. Angela's business touches the bottom of the tear jug. It would be impossible to imagine a more vapid story. Harrison, in fact, grows more mawkish book by book. He is touched, I should say, by the delusion that he has a mission to make life sweeter, to preach the finer things, to radiate gladness. What? More gladness? Another volt or two and all civilized adults will join the Italians and Yugoslavs in their headlong Hegira. A few more amperes and the land will be abandoned to the Jews, the ex-Confederates, and the Bolsheviki. 4. The Last of the Victorians If William Allen White lives as long as Tennyson and does not reform, our grandchildren will see the Victorian era gasping out its last breath in 1951. And 83 is no great age in Kansas where sin is unknown. It may be, in fact, 1960 or even 1970 before the world hears the last of honest poverty, chaste affection, and manly tears. For so long as White holds a pen, these ancient sweets will be on sale at the department store book counters, and they will grow sweeter and sweeter, I dare say, as he works them over and over. In his very first book of fiction there was a flavor of chewing gum and marshmallows. In a certain rich man the intelligent palate detected saccharin. In the heart of a fool, his latest, the thing is carried a step further. If you are a forward looker and a right thinker, if you believe that God is in the heaven and all is for the best, if you yearn to uplift and like to sob, then the volume will probably affect you in the incomparable phrase of Clayton Hamilton, like the music of a million Easter lilies leaping from the grave and laughing with the silver singing. But if you are a carnal fellow, as I am, with a stomach ruined by alcohol, it will gag you. When I say that White is a Victorian, I do not allude, of course, to the Victorianism of Thackeray and Tennyson, but to that of Felicia Hemans, of Samuel Smiles, and of Dickens at his most maudlin. Perhaps an even closer relative is to be found in the Duchess. White, like the Duchess, is absolutely humorless, and when he begins laying on the mayonnaise, absolutely shameless. I dare say the same sort of reader admires both. The high school girl, first seized by amorous tremors, the obese multipara in her greasy kimono, the remote and weepful farm wife. But here a doubt intrudes itself. Is it possible to imagine a woman sentimental enough to survive in the heart of a fool? I am constrained to question it. In women, once they get beyond adolescence, there is always a saving touch of irony. The life they lead infallibly makes cynics of them, though sometimes they don't know it. Observe the books they write, chiefly sardonic stuff with heroes who are fools. Even their glad books, enormously successful among other women, stop far short of the sentimentality put between covers by men. For example, the aforesaid Harrison, Harold Bell Wright, and the present White. Nay, it is the male sex that snuffles most and is easiest touched, particularly in America. The American man is forever falling a victim to his tender feelings. It was by that route that the collectors for the YMCA reached him. It is thus that he is bagged incessantly by political tear-squeezers. It is precisely his softness that makes him the slave of his womenfolk. What White gives him is exactly the sort of mush that is on tap in the Chautauquas. In the heart of a fool, like a certain rich man, is aimed deliberately and with the utmost accuracy at the delicate gizzard of the small-town yokel, the small-town yokel male, the horrible end product of fifty years of Christian endeavor, the little red schoolhouse, and the direct primary. The white formula is simple to the verge of austerity. It is in essence no more than a dramatization of all the current political and sociological rumble-bumble by Roosevelt out of Coxey's army, with music by the choir of the First Methodist Church. On the one side are the hell-hounds of plutocracy, the money-demons, the plunderbund, and their attendant bosses, strike-breakers, seducers, Nietzscheans, free lovers, atheists, and corrupt journalists. On the other side are the great masses of the plain people and their attendant uplifters, good Samaritans, honest working men, faithful husbands, inspired dreamers, and tin-horn messiahs. These two armies join battle, the bad against the good, and for five hundred pages or more the good get all the worst of it. Their jobs are taken away from them, their votes are bartered, their mortgages are foreclosed, their women are debauched. Their savings are looted, their poor orphans are turned out to starve. A sad business, surely. One wallows in almost unendurable emotions. The tears gush. It is as affecting as a movie. 
even the prose rises to a sort of gospel tent chant like that of a baptist savonarola with every second sentence beginning with and but or for but we are already near the end and no escape is in sight can it be that white is stumped like mark twain in his medieval romance that virtue will succumb to the interests do not fear in the third from the last chapter hen jackson the stagehand returns from the dutchman's at the corner and throws on a rose spotlight and then an amber and then a violet and then a blue one by one the rays of hope began to shoot across the stage dr hamilton's easter lilies leap from their tomb the dramatis personae all save the local j pierpont morgan begin laughing with the silver singing and as the curtain falls the whole scene is bathed in luminiferous ether and the professor breaks into onward christian soldiers on the cabinet organ and there is a happy comfortable sobbing and an upward rolling of eyes and a vast blowing of noses in brief the finish of a chautauqua lecture on the grand future of america or the glory of service in brief slobber it would be difficult to imagine more saccharine writing or a more mawkish and preposterous point of view life as white sees it is a purely moral phenomenon like living pictures by the epworth league the virtuous are the downtrodden the up and doing are all scoundrels it pays to be poor and pious ambition is a serpent one honest knight of pythias is worth ten thousand rockefellers the pastor is always right so is the ladies home journal the impulse that leads a young yokel of say twenty-two to seek marriage with a poor working girl of say eighteen is the most elevating noble honorable and godlike impulse native to the human consciousness not the slightest sign of an apprehension of life as the gaudiest and most gorgeous of spectacles not a trace of healthy delight in the eternal struggle for existence not the faintest suggestion of dreiser's great gusto or of conrad's penetrating irony not even in the massive fact of death itself and like all the other victorians this one from the kansas steps is given to wholesale massacres does he see anything mysterious staggering awful inexplicable but only an excuse for a sentimental orgy alas what would you it is ghastly drivel to be sure but isn't it after all thoroughly american i have an uneasy suspicion that it is that in the heart of a fool is at bottom a vastly more american book than anything that james branch cabell has done or vincent o'sullivan or edith wharton or even howells it springs from the heart of the land it is the aesthetic echo of thousands of movements of hundreds of thousands of sentimental crusades of millions of ecstatic gospel meetings this is what the authentic american public unpolluted by intelligence wants and this is one of the reasons why the english sniff whenever they look our way but has white no merit he has he is an honest and a respectable man he is a patriot he trusts god he venerates what is left of the constitution he once wrote a capital editorial what's the matter with kansas he has the knack when his tears are turned off of writing a clear and graceful english five a bad novelist as i have said it is not the artistic merit and dignity of a novel but often simply its content as document that makes for its success in the united states the criterion of truth applied to it is not the criterion of an artist but that of a newspaper editorial writer the question is not is it in accord with the profoundest impulses and motives of humanity but is it in accord with the current pishposh this accounts for the huge popularity of such confections as upton sinclair's the jungle and blasco ibanez's the four horsemen of the apocalypse neither had much value as a work of art at all events neither was perceptibly superior to many contemporary novels that made no stir at all but each had the advantage of reinforcing an emotion already aroused of falling into step with the procession of the moment had there been no fever of muckraking and trust-busting in nineteen o six the jungle would have died the death in the columns of the appeal to reason unheard of by the populace in general and had the united states been engaged against france instead of for france in nineteen eighteen there would have been no argument in the literary weeklies that blasco was a novelist of the first rank and his story a masterpiece comparable to germinal sinclair was made by the jungle and has been trying his hardest to unmake himself ever since another of the same sort is ernest poole author of the harbor 
the harbor judged by any intelligible aesthetic standard was a bad novel its transactions were forced and unconvincing its central character was shadowy and often incomprehensible the manner of its writing was quite without distinction but it happened to be printed at a time when the chief ideas in it had a great deal of popularity when its vague grappling with insoluble sociological problems was the sport of all the weeklies and of half the more sober newspapers when a nebulous highfalutin bolshevism was in the air and so it excited interest and took on an aspect of profundity that its discussion of those problems was superficial that it said nothing new and got nowhere all this was not an influence against its success but an influence in favor of its success for the sort of mind that fed upon the nebulous professor-made politics and sociology of nineteen fifteen was the sort of mind that is chronically avid of half-truths and is chronically suspicious of forthright thinking this has been demonstrated since that time by its easy volta face and the presence of emotion the very ideas that Poole's vapid hero toyed with in 1915 to the delight of the novel-reading intelligentsia would have damned the book as a pamphlet for the IWW, or even perhaps as German propaganda three years later. But meanwhile it had been forgotten, as novels are always forgotten, and all that remained of it was a general impression that Poole, in some way or other, was a superior fellow and to be treated with respect. His subsequent books have tried that theory severely. The family was grounded upon one of the elemental tragedies which serve a novelist most safely. The dismay of an aging man as his children drift away from him. Here was a subject full of poignant drama, and what is more, drama simple enough to develop itself without making any great demand upon the invention. Poole burdened it with too much background, and then killed it altogether by making his characters wooden. It began with a high air. It creaked and wobbled at the close. The catastrophe was quite without effect. His second wife dropped several stories lower. It turned out on inspection to be no more than a moral tale, feeble, wishy-washy, and irritating. Everything in it about the corrupting effects of money, lust, and display, about the swinishness of cabaret society in New York, about the American male's absurd slavery to his women, had been said before by such gifted Balzacs as Robert W. Chambers and Owen Johnson, and what is more, far better said. The writing, in fact, exactly matched the theme. It was labored, artificial, dull. In the whole volume there was not a single original phrase. Once it was put down, not a scene remained in the memory or a character. It was a cheap, a hollow, and in places almost an idiotic book. At the time I write, this is the whole product of Poole as novelist. Three novels. Bad. Worse. Worst. 6. A Broadway Brandes. I have hitherto, in discussing White de Kansas, presented a fragile dahlia from the rhetorical garden of Clayton Hamilton, M.A. Columbia. I now present the whole passage. Whenever, in a world-historic war, the side of righteousness has triumphed, a great overflowing of art has followed soon upon the fact of victory. The noblest instincts of mankind, aroused in perilous moments fraught with intimations of mortality, have surged and soared, beneath the sunshine of a subsequent and dear-bought peace into an immeasurable empyrean of heroic eloquence. Whenever right has circumvented might, art has sprung alive into the world and with the music of a million Easter lilies leaping from the grave and laughing with a silver singing. With the highest respect for a magister artium, a pedagogue of Columbia University, a lecturer in Miss Spence's school and the classic school for girls, and a vice president of the National Institute of Arts and Letters. Boo! End of chapter 11 Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 12 of Prejudices, First Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prejudices, First Series by H. L. Mencken. The Genealogy of Etiquette. Barring sociology, which is yet, of course, scarcely a science at all, but rather a monkey shine which happens to pay, like play acting or theology, psychology is the youngest of the sciences, and hence chiefly guesswork, empiricism, hocus pocus, poppycock. On the one hand, there are still enormous gaps in its data, so that 
the determination of its simplest principles remains difficult not to say impossible and on the other hand the very hollowness and nebulosity of it particularly around its edges encourages a horde of quacks to invade it sophisticate it and make nonsense of it worse this state of affairs tends to such confusion of effort and direction that the quack and the honest inquirer are often found in the same man it is indeed a commonplace to encounter a professor who spends his days in the laborious accumulation of psychological statistics sticking pins into babies and platting upon a chart the ebb and flow of their yells and his nights chasing poltergeists and other such celestial fauna over the hurdles of a spiritualist's atelier or gazing into a crystal in the privacy of his own chamber the binet test and the buncombe of mesmerism are alike the children of what we roughly denominate psychology and perhaps of equal legitimacy even so ingenious and competent an investigator as professor dr sigmund freud who has told us a lot that is of the first importance about the materials and machinery of thought has also told us a lot that is trivial and dubious the essential doctrines of freudism no doubt come close to the truth but many of freud's remoter deductions are far more scandalous than sound and many of the professed freudians both american and european have grease paint on their noses and bladders in their hands and are otherwise quite indistinguishable from evangelists and circus clowns in this condition of the science it is no wonder that we find it wasting its chief force upon problems that are petty and idle when they are not downright and palpably insoluble and passing over problems that are of immediate concern to all of us and that might be quite readily solved or at any rate considerably illuminated by an intelligent study of the data already available after all not many of us care a hoot whether sir oliver lodge and the indian chief waka waka muck are happy in heaven for not many of us have any hope or desire to meet them there nor are we greatly excited by the discovery that of twenty-five freshmen who are hit with clubs seventeen and three-quarters will say ouch and twenty-two and one-fifth will say damn nor by a table showing that thirty-eight point two per centum of all men accused of homicide confess when locked up with the carcasses of their victims including twenty-three point four per centum who are innocent nor by plans and specifications by cagliostro out of lucretia borgia for teaching poor godforsaken school children to write before they can read and to multiply before they can add nor by endless disputes between half-witted pundits as to the precise difference between perception and cognition nor by even longer feuds between pundits even crazier over free will the subconscious the endoneurium the functions of the corpora quadrigemina and the meaning of dreams in which one is pursued by hyenas process servers or grass widows nay we do not bubble with rejoicing when such fruits of psychological deep down diving and much mud upbringing researches are laid before us for after all they do not offer us any nourishment there is nothing in them to engage our teeth they fail to make life more comprehensible and hence more bearable what we yearn to know something about is the process whereby the ideas of every day are engendered in the skulls of those about us to the end that we may pursue a straighter and a safer course through the muddle that is life why do the great majority of presbyterians and for that matter of baptists episcopalians and swedenborgians as well regard it as unlucky to meet a black cat and lucky to find a pin what are the logical steps behind the theory that it is indecent to eat peas with a knife 
by what process does an otherwise sane man arrive at the conclusion that he will go to hell unless he is baptized by total immersion in water what causes men to be faithful to their wives habit fear poverty lack of imagination lack of enterprise stupidity religion what is the psychological basis of commercial morality what is the true nature of the vague pooling of desires that rousseau called the social contract why does an american regard it as scandalous to wear dress clothes at a funeral and a frenchman regard it as equally scandalous not to wear them why is it that men trust one another so readily and women trust one another so seldom why are we all so greatly affected by statements that we know are not true example in lincoln's gettysburg speech the declaration of independence and the one hundred third psalm what is the origin of the so-called double standard of morality why are women forbidden to take off their hats in church what is happiness intelligence sin courage virtue beauty all these are questions of interest and importance to all of us for their solution would materially improve the accuracy of our outlook upon the world and with it our mastery of our environment but the psychologists busily engaged in chasing their tails leave them unanswered and in most cases even unasked the late william james more acute than the general saw how precious little was known about the psychological inwardness of religion and to the illumination of this darkness he addressed himself in his book the varieties of religious experience but life being short and science long he got little beyond the statement of the problem and the marshalling of the grosser evidence and even at this business he allowed himself to be constantly interrupted by spooks hobgoblins seventh sons of seventh sons and other such characteristic pets of psychologists in the same way one gustave le bon a frenchman undertook a psychological study of the crowd mind and then blew up add the investigations of freud and his school chiefly into abnormal states of mind and those of lombroso and his school chiefly quackish and for the yellow journals and the idle romancing of such inquirers as professor dr thorstein veblen and you have exhausted the list of contributions to what may be called practical and everyday psychology the reverend professors i dare say have been doing some useful ploughing and planting all of their meticulous pin sticking and measuring and chart making in the course of time will enable their successors to approach the real problems of mind with more assurance than is now possible and perhaps help to their solution but in the meantime the public and social utility of psychology remains very small for it is still unable to differentiate accurately between the true and the false or to give us any effective protection against the fallacies superstitions crazes and hysterias which rage in the world in this emergency it is not only permissible but even laudable for the amateur to sniff inquiringly through the psychological pasture essaying modestly to uproot things that the myopic or perhaps more accurately hypermetropic professionals have overlooked the late friedrich willem nietzsche did it often and the usufructs were many curious and daring guesses some of them probably close to accuracy as to the genesis of this that or the other common delusion of man i e the delusion that the law of the survival of the fittest may be repealed by an act of congress into the same field several very interesting expeditions have been made 
by Dr. Elsie Clues Parsons, a lady once celebrated by Park Row for her invention of trial marriage. An invention, by the way, in which the Nietzsche aforesaid preceded her by at least a dozen years. The records of her researches are to be found in a brief series of books, The Family, The Old-Fashioned Woman, and Fear and Conventionality. Apparently they have wrung relatively little esteem from the learned, for I seldom encounter a reference to them, and Dr. Parsons herself is denied the very modest reward of mention in Who's Who in America. Nevertheless, they are extremely instructive books, particularly Fear and Conventionality. I know of no other work, indeed, which offers a better array of observations upon that powerful complex of assumptions, prejudices, instinctive reactions, racial emotions, and unbreakable vices of mind, which enters so massively into the daily thinking of all of us. The author does not concern herself, as so many psychologists fall into the habit of doing, with thinking as a purely laboratory phenomenon, a process in vacuo. What she deals with is thinking as it is done by men and women in the real world, thinking that is only half intellectual, the other half being as automatic and unintelligent as swallowing, blinking the eye, or falling in love. The power of the complex that I have mentioned is usually very much underestimated, not only by psychologists, but also by all other persons who pretend to culture. We take pride in the fact that we are thinking animals, and like to believe that our thoughts are free, but the truth is that nine-tenths of them are rigidly conditioned by the babbling that goes on around us from birth, and that the business of considering this babbling objectively, separating the true in it from the false, is an intellectual feat of such stupendous difficulty that very few men are ever able to achieve it. The amazing slanging which went on between the English professors and the German professors in the early days of the late war showed how little even cold and academic men are really moved by the bald truth, and how much by hot and unintelligible likes and dislikes. The patriotic hysteria of the war simply allowed these eminent pedagogues to say of one another openly and to loud applause what they would have been ashamed to say in times of greater amenity, and what most of them would have denied stoutly that they believed. Nevertheless, it is probably a fact that before there was a sign of war, the average English professor, deep down in his heart, thought that any man who ate sauerkraut and went to the opera in a sack coat and intrigued for the appellation of Geheimrat and preferred German music to English poetry and venerated Bismarck and called his wife Mutter was a scoundrel. He did not say so aloud, and no doubt it would have offended him had you accused him of believing it, but he believed it all the same, and his belief in it gave a muddy, bilious color to his view of German metaphysics, German electrochemistry, and the German chronology of Babylonian kings. And by the same token, the average German professor, far down in the ghostly recesses of his hulk, held that any man who read the London Times, and ate salt fish at first breakfast, and drank tea of an afternoon, and spoke of Oxford as a university, was a schafskop, a schuft, and possibly even a schweinehund. Nay, not one of us is a free agent. Not one of us actually thinks for himself, or in any orderly and scientific manner. The pressure of environment, of mass ideas, of the socialized intelligence, improperly so called, is too enormous to be withstood. No American, no matter how sharp his critical sense, can ever get away from the notion 
that democracy is in some subtle and mysterious way more conducive to human progress and more pleasing to a just god than any of the systems of government which stand opposed to it in the privacy of his study he may observe very clearly that it exalts the facile and specious man above the really competent man and from this observation he may draw the conclusion that its abandonment would be desirable but once he emerges from his academic seclusion and resumes the rubbing of noses with his fellow men he will begin to be tortured by a sneaking feeling that such ideas are heretical and unmanly and the next time the band begins to play he will thrill with the best of them or the worst the actual phenomenon in truth was copiously on display during the war having myself the character among my acquaintances of one holding the democratic theory in some doubt i was often approached by gentlemen who told me in great confidence that they had been seized by the same tremors among them were journalists employed daily in demanding that democracy be forced upon the whole world and army officers engaged at least theoretically in forcing it all these men in reflective moments struggled with ifs and buts but every one of them in his public capacity as a good citizen quickly went back to thinking as a good citizen was then expected to think and even to a certain inflammatory ranting for what behind the door he gravely questioned it is the business of dr parsons in fear and conventionality to prod into certain of the ideas which thus pour into every man's mind from the circumambient air sweeping away like some huge cataract the feeble resistance that his own powers of ratiocination can offer in particular she devotes herself to an examination of those general ideas which condition the thought and action of man as a social being those general ideas which govern his everyday attitude toward his fellow men and his prevailing view of himself in one direction they lay upon us the bonds of what we call etiquette i e the duty of considering the habits and feelings of those around us and in another direction they throttle us with what we call morality i e the rules which protect the life and property of those around us but as dr parsons shows the boundary between etiquette and morality is very dimly drawn and it is often impossible to say of a given action whether it is downright immoral or merely a breach of the punctilio even when the moral law is plainly running considerations of mere amenity and politeness may still make themselves felt thus as dr parsons points out there is even an etiquette of adultery the ami de la famille vows not to kiss his mistress in her husband's house not in fear but quote, as an expression of conjugal consideration unquote as a sign that he has not forgotten the thoughtfulness expected of a gentleman and in this delicate field as might be expected the differences in racial attitudes are almost diametrical the englishman surprising his wife with a lover sues the rogue for damages and has public opinion behind him but for an american to do it would be for him to lose caste at once and forever the plain and only duty of the american is to open upon the fellow with artillery hitting him if the scene is south of the potomac and missing him if it is above i confess to an endless interest in such puzzling niceties and to much curiosity as to their origins and meaning why do we americans take off our hats when we meet a flapper on the street and yet stand covered before a male of the highest eminence a continental would regard this last as boorish to the last degree in greeting any equal or superior male or female actual or merely conventional 
he lifts his headpiece why does it strike us as ludicrous to see a man in dress clothes before six p m the continental puts them on whenever he has a solemn visit to make whether the hour be six or noon why do we regard it as indecent to tuck the napkin between the waistcoat buttons or into the neck at meals the frenchman does it without thought of crime so does the italian so does the german all three are punctilious men far more so indeed than we are why do we snicker at the man who wears a wedding ring most continentals would stare askance at the husband who didn't why is it bad manners in europe and america to ask a stranger his or her age and a friendly attention in china why do we regard it as absurd to distinguish a woman by her husband's title e g mrs judge jones mrs professor smith in teutonic and scandinavian europe the omission of the title would be looked upon as an affront such fine distinctions so ardently supported raise many interesting questions but the attempt to answer them quickly gets one bogged several years ago i ventured to lift a sad voice against a custom common in america that of married men in speaking of their wives employing the full panoply of mrs brown it was my contention supported i thought by logical considerations of the loftiest order that a husband in speaking of his wife to his equals should say my wife that the more formal mode of designation should be reserved for inferiors and for strangers of undetermined position this contention somewhat to my surprise was vigorously combated by various volunteer experts at first they rested their case upon the mere authority of custom forgetting that this custom was by no means universal but finally one of them came forward with a more analytical and cogent defence the defence to wit that my wife connoted proprietorship and was thus offensive to a wife's amour propre but what of my sister and my mother surely it is nowhere the custom for a man addressing an equal to speak of his sister as miss smith the discussion however came to nothing it was impossible to carry it on logically the essence of all such inquiries lies in the discovery that there is a force within the liver and lights of man that is infinitely more potent than logic his reflections perhaps may take on intellectually recognizable forms but they seldom lead to intellectually recognizable conclusions nevertheless dr parsons offers something in her book that may conceivably help to a better understanding of them and that is the doctrine that the strange persistence of these rubber stamp ideas often unintelligible and sometimes plainly absurd is due to fear and that this fear is the product of a very real danger the safety of human society lies in the assumption that every individual composing it in a given situation will act in a manner hitherto approved as seemly that is to say he is expected to react to his environment according to a fixed pattern not necessarily because that pattern is the best imaginable but simply because it is determined and understood if he fails to do so if he reacts in a novel manner conducive perhaps to his better advantage or to what he thinks is his better advantage then he disappoints the expectation of those around him and forces them to meet the new situation he has created by the exercise of independent thought such independent thought to a good many men is quite impossible and to the overwhelming majority of men extremely painful to all of us says dr parsons to the animal to the savage and to the civilized being few demands are as uncomfortable 
disquieting or fearful as the call to innovate adaptations we all of us dislike or hate we dodge or shirk them as best we may and the man who compels us to make them against our wills we punish by withdrawing from him that understanding and friendliness which he in turn looks for and counts upon in other words we set him apart as one who is anti-social and not to be dealt with and according as his rebellion has been small or great we call him a boor or a criminal this distrust of the unknown this fear of doing something unusual is probably at the bottom of many ideas and institutions that are commonly credited to other motives for example monogamy the orthodox explanation of monogamy is that it is a manifestation of the desire to have and to hold property that the husband defends his solitary right to his wife even at the cost of his own freedom because she is the pearl among his chattels but dr parsons argues and with a good deal of plausibility that the real moving force both in the husband and the wife may be merely the force of habit the antipathy to experiment and innovation it is easier and safer to stick to the one wife than to risk adventures with another wife and the immense social pressure that i have just described is all on the side of sticking moreover the indulgence of a habit automatically strengthens its bonds what we have done once or thought once we are more apt than we were before to do and think again or as the late professor william james put it the selection of a particular hole to live in of a particular mate a particular anything in short out of a possible multitude carries with it an insensibility to other opportunities and occasions an insensibility which can only be described physiologically as an inhibition of new impulses by the habit of old ones already formed the possession of homes and wives of our own makes us strangely insensible to the charms of other people the original impulse which got us homes wives seems to exhaust itself in its first achievements and to leave no surplus energy for reacting on new cases thus the benedict looks no more on women at least for a while and the post honeymoon bride as the late david graham phillips once told us neglects the bedizenments which got her a man in view of the popular or general character of most of the taboos which put a break upon personal liberty in thought and action that is to say in view of their enforcement by people in the mass and not by definite specialists in conduct it is quite natural to find that they are of extra force in democratic societies for it is the distinguishing mark of democratic societies that they exalt the powers of the majority almost infinitely and tend to deny the minority any rights whatever under a society dominated by a small caste the revolutionist in custom despite the axiom to the contrary has a relatively easy time of it for the persons whose approval he seeks for his innovation are relatively few in number and most of them are already habituated to more or less intelligible and independent thinking but under a democracy he is opposed by a horde so vast that it is a practical impossibility for him without complex and expensive machinery to reach and convince all of its members and even if he could reach them he would find most of them quite incapable of rising out of their accustomed grooves they cannot understand innovations that are genuinely novel and they don't want to understand them their one desire is to put them down even at this late day with enlightenment raging through the republic like a pestilence it would cost the average southern or middle western congressman his seat if he appeared among his constituents in spats or wearing a wrist watch and if a justice of the supreme court of the united states however gigantic his learning and his juridic rectitude were taken in criminal conversation with the wife of a senator he would be destroyed instanter and if suddenly revolting against the democratic idea 
he were to propose however gingerly its abandonment he would be destroyed with the same dispatch but how then explain the fact that the populace is constantly ravished and set aflame by fresh brigades of moral political and sociological revolutionists that it is forever playing the eager victim to new mountebanks the explanation lies in the simple circumstance that these performers upon the public midriff are always careful to ladle out nothing actually new and hence nothing incomprehensible alarming and accursed what they offer is always the same old panacea with an extra gaudy label the tried tasted and much loved dose the colic cure that mother used to make superficially the united states seems to suffer from an endless and astounding neophilism actually all its thinking is done within the boundaries of a very small group of political economic and religious ideas most of them unsound for example there is the fundamental idea of democracy the idea that all political power should remain in the hands of the populace that its exercise by superior men is intrinsically immoral out of this idea spring innumerable notions and crazes that are no more at bottom than restatements of it in sentimental terms rotation in office direct elections the initiative and referendum the recall the popular primary and so on again there is the primary doctrine that the possession of a great wealth is a crime a doctrine half a religious heritage and half the product of mere mob envy out of it have come free silver trust busting government ownership muckraking populism bleasism progressivism the milder forms of socialism the whole gasconade of reform politics yet again there is the ineradicable peasant suspicion of the man who is having a better time in the world a suspicion grounded like the foregoing partly upon undisguised envy and partly upon archaic and barbaric religious taboos out of it have come all the glittering pearls of the uplift from abolition to prohibition and from the crusade against horse racing to the man act the whole political history of the united states is a history of these three ideas there has never been an issue before the people that could not be translated into one or another of them what is more they have also colored the fundamental philosophical and particularly epistemological doctrines of the american people and their moral theory and even their foreign relations the late war very unpopular at the start was sold to them as the advertising phrase has it by representing it as a campaign for the salvation of democracy half religious and wholly altruistic so represented to them they embraced it represented as the highly obscure and complex thing it actually was it would have been beyond their comprehension and hence abhorrent to them outside this circle of their elemental convictions they are quite incapable of rational thought one is not surprised to hear of bismarck a thorough royalist discussing democracy with calm and fairness but it would be unimaginable for the american people or for any other democratic people to discuss royalism in the same manner it would take a cataclysm to bring them to any such violation of their mental habits when such a cataclysm occurs they embrace the new ideas that are its fruits with the same adamantine firmness one year before the french revolution disobedience to the king was unthinkable to the average frenchman only a few daringly immoral men cherished the notion but one year after the fall of the bastille obedience to the king was equally unthinkable the russian bolsheviki whose doings have furnished a great deal of immensely interesting material to the student of popular psychology put the principle into plain words once they were in the saddle they decreed the abolition of the old imperial censorship and announced that speech would be free henceforth but 
only so long as it kept within the bounds of the Bolshevist revelation. In other words, any citizen was free to think and speak whatever he pleased, but only so long as it did not violate certain fundamental ideas. This is precisely the sort of freedom that has prevailed in the United States since the first days. It is the only sort of freedom comprehensible to the average man. It accurately reveals his constitutional inability to shake himself free from the illogical and often quite unintelligible prejudices, instincts, and mental vices that condition ninety percent of all his thinking. But here I wander into political speculation and, no doubt, stand in contumacy of some statute of Congress. Dr. Parsons avoids politics in her very interesting book, she confines herself to the purely social relations, example, between man and woman, parent and child, host and guest, master and servant. The facts she offers are vastly interesting, and their discovery and coordination reveal a tremendous industry. But of even greater interest are the facts that lie over the margin of her inquiry here is a golden opportunity for other investigators i often wonder that the field is so little explored perhaps the freudians once they get rid of their sexual obsession will enter it and chart it no doubt the inferiority complex described by professor dr alfred adler will one day provide an intelligible explanation of many of the puzzling phenomena of mob thinking in the work of Professor Dr. Freud himself, there is perhaps a clue to the origin and anatomy of Puritanism, that worst of intellectual nephritises. I live in hope that the Freudians will fall upon the business without much further delay. Why do otherwise sane men believe in spirits? What is the genesis of the American axiom that the fine arts are unmanly? What is the precise machinery of the process called falling in love why do people believe newspapers let there be light end of chapter 12 recording by linda johnson chapter 13 of prejudices first series this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prejudices, First Series, by H. L. Mencken, The American Magazine It is astonishing, considering the enormous influence of the popular magazine upon American literature, such as it is, that there is but one book in type upon magazine history in the Republic. That lone volume is the magazine in america by professor dr algernon tassin a learned birchman of the great university of columbia and it is so badly written that the interest of its matter is almost concealed almost but fortunately not quite the professor in fact puts english to paper with all the traditional dullness of his flatulent order and as usual he is most horribly dull when he is trying most kittenishly to be lively. I spare you examples of his writing. If you know the lady essayists of the United States and their academic imitators in pantaloons, you know the sort of arch and whimsical jocosity he ladles out. But, as I have hinted, there is something worth attending to in his story, for all the defects of its presentation and so his book is not to be sniffed at. He has, at all events, brought together a great mass of scattered and concealed facts, and arranged them conveniently for whoever deals with them next. The job was plainly a long and laborious one, and rasping to the higher cerebral centers. The historian had to make his mole-like way through the endless files of old and stupid magazines, he had to read the insipid biographies and autobiographies of dead and forgotten editors, many of them college professors, preachers out of work, 
prehistoric uplifters and bad poets he had to sort out the facts from the fancies of such incurable liars as griswold he had to hack and blast a path across a virgin wilderness the thing was worth doing and as i say it has been done with commendable pertinacity considering the noisiness of the american magazines of today it is rather instructive to glance back at the timorous and bloodless quality of their progenitors. All of the early ones, when they were not simply monthly newspapers or almanacs, were depressingly literary in tone, and dealt chiefly in stupid poetry, silly essays, and artificial fiction. The one great fear of their editors seems to have been that of offending someone. All of the pioneer prospectuses were full of assurances that nothing would be printed which even, quote, the most fastidious, end quote, could object to. Literature in those days, say, from 1830 to 1860, was almost completely cut off from contemporary life. It mirrored not the struggle for existence, so fierce and dramatic in the new nation, but the pallid reflections of poetasters, self-advertising clergymen, sissified gentlemen of taste, and other such donkeys. Poe waded into these literati and shook them up a bit, but even after the Civil War, the majority of them continued to spin pretty cobwebs. Edmund Clarence Stedman and Donald Jean Mitchell were excellent specimens of the clan. Its last survivor was the lachrymose William Winter, the literature manufactured by these tear-squeezers, though often enough produced in beer-cellars, was frankly aimed at the young person. Its main purpose was to avoid giving offense. It breathed a heavy and oleaginous piety, a snug niceness, a sickening sweetness. It is as dead today as Balaam's ass. The Atlantic Monthly was set up by men in revolt against this reign of mush, as Putnam's had been a few years before. But the business of reform proved to be difficult and hazardous, and it was a long while before a healthier breed of authors could be developed and a public for them found. There is not much in the Atlantic, wrote Charles Eliot Norton to Lowell in 1874, that is likely to be read twice save by its writers and this is what the great public likes you should hear godkin express himself in private on this topic harper's magazine in those days was made up almost wholly of cribbings from england the north american review had sunk into stodginess and imbecility putnam's was dead or dying the atlantic had yet to discover Mark Twain. It was the era of Godey's Ladies' Book. The new note, so long awaited, was struck at last by Scribner's, now the century, and not to be confused with the Scribner's of today. It not only threw all the old traditions overboard, it established new traditions almost at once. For the first time, a great magazine began to take notice of the daily life of the American people. It started off with a truly remarkable series of articles on the Civil War. It plunged into contemporary politics. It eagerly sought out and encouraged new writers. It began printing decent pictures instead of the old chromos. It forced itself by the sheer originality and enterprise of its editing upon the public attention. American literature owes more to the century than to any other magazine, and perhaps American thinking owes almost as much. It was the first literary periodical to arrest and interest the really first-class men of the country. It beat the Atlantic because it wasn't burdened with the Atlantic's decaying cargo of Boston Brahmins. It beat all the others because it was infinitely and obviously better. Almost everything that is good in the American magazine of today, almost everything that sets it above the English magazine or the Continental magazine, stems from the century. 
at the moment of course it holds no such clear field perhaps it has served its function and is ready for a placid old age the thing that displaced it was the yellow magazine of the mcclure's type a variety of magazine which surpassed it in the race for circulation by exaggerating and vulgarizing all its merits dr tassin seems to think with william archer that s s mcclure was the inventor of this type but the truth is that its real father was the unknown originator of the sunday supplement what mcclure a shrewd literary bagman did was to apply the sensational methods of the cheap newspaper to a new and cheap magazine yellow journalism was rising and he went in on the tide the satanic hearst was getting on his legs at the same time and i dare say that the muckraking magazines even in their palmy days followed him a good deal more than they led him mcclure and the imitators of mcclure borrowed his adept thumping of the tom-tom muncie and the imitators of muncie borrowed his mush mcclure's and everybody's even when they had the whole nation by the ears did little save repeat in solemn awful tones what hearst had said before as for muncie's at the height of its circulation it was little more than a sunday magazine section on smooth paper and with somewhat clearer half-tones than hearst could print nearly all the genuinely original ideas of these yankee harmsworths of yesterday turned out badly john brisbane walker with the cosmopolitan tried to make his magazine a sort of national university and it went to pot ridgeway of everybody's planned a weekly to be published in a dozen cities simultaneously and lost a fortune trying to establish it mcclure facing a situation to be described presently couldn't manage it and his magazine got away from him as for muncie there are many wrecks behind him he is forever experimenting boldly and failing gloriously even his claim to have invented the all-fiction magazine is open to caveat there were probably plenty of such things in substance if not in name before the argosy hearst the teacher of them all now openly holds the place that belongs to him he has galvanized the corpse of the old cosmopolitan into a great success he has distanced all rivals with hearst's he has beaten the english on their own ground with nash's and he has rehabilitated various lesser magazines more he has forced the other magazine publishers to imitate him a glance at mcclure's today offers all the proof that is needed of his influence upon his inferiors dr tassin apparently in fear of making his book too nearly good halts his chronicle at its most interesting point for he says nothing of what has gone on since nineteen hundred and very much indeed has gone on since nineteen hundred for one thing the saturday evening post has made its unparalleled success created its new type of american literature for department store buyers and shoe drummers and bred its school of brisk business-like high-speed authors for another thing the ladies home journal once supreme in its field has seen the rise of a swarm of imitators some of them very prosperous for a third thing the all-fiction magazine of muncie robert bonner and street and smith has degenerated into so dubious a hussy that muncie a very moral man must blush every time he thinks of it for a fourth thing the moving picture craze has created an entirely new type of magazine and it has elbowed many other types from the stands and for a fifth thing to make an end the muckraking magazine has blown up and is no more why this last have all the possible candidates for the rake been raked 
is there no longer any taste for scandal in the popular breast i have heard endless discussion of these questions and many ingenious answers but all of them fail to answer in this emergency i offer one of my own it is this that the muckraking magazine came to grief not because the public tired of muckraking but because the muckraking that it began with succeeded that is to say the villains so long belabored by the steffenses the tarbells and the phillipses were either driven from the national scene or forced at least temporarily into rectitude worse their places in public life were largely taken by nominees whose chemical purity was guaranteed by these same magazines and so the latter found their occupation gone and their following with it the great masses of the plain people eager to swallow denunciation in horse doctor doses gagged at the first spoonful of praise they courtled and read on when aldrich boscox gas addicts john d rockefeller and the other bugaboos of the time were belabored every month but they promptly sickened and went elsewhere when judge ben b lindsay francis j henney governor folk and the rest of the bogus saints began to be hymned the same phenomenon is constantly witnessed upon the lower level of daily journalism let a vociferous reform newspaper overthrow the old gang and elect its own candidates and at once it is in a perilous condition its stock in trade is gone it can no longer give a good show within the popular meaning of a good show for what the public wants eternally at least the american public is rough work it delights in vituperation it revels in scandal it is always on the side of the man or journal making the charges no matter how slight the probability that the accused is guilty the late roosevelt perhaps one of the greatest rabble rousers the world has ever seen was privy to this fact and made it the cornerstone of his singularly cynical and effective politics he was forever calling names making accusations unearthing and denouncing demons dr wilson a performer of scarcely less talent has sought to pursue the same plan with varying fidelity and success he was a popular hero so long as he confined himself to reviling men and things the hell-hounds of plutocracy the socialists the kaiser the irish the senate minority but the moment he found himself on the side of the defense he began to wobble just as roosevelt before him had begun to wobble when he found himself burdened with the intricate constructive program of the progressives roosevelt shook himself free by deserting the progressives but wilson found it impossible to get rid of his league of nations and so for a while at least he presented a quite typical picture of a muckraker hamstrung by blows from the wrong end of the rake that the old appetite for bloody shows is not dead but only sleepeth is well exhibited by the recent revival of the weekly of opinion ten years ago the weekly seemed to be absolutely extinct even the nation survived only as a half-forgotten appendage of the evening post then of a sudden the alliance was broken the evening post succumbed to wall street the nation started on an independent course and straightway made a great success and why simply because it began breaking heads not the old heads of the mcclure's era of course but nevertheless heads salient enough to make excellent targets for years it had been moribund no one read it save a dwindling company of old men its influence gradually approached nil but by the elementary device of switching from mild expostulation to violent and effective denunciation it made a new public almost overnight and is now very widely read extensively quoted 
and increasingly heeded i often wonder that so few publishers of periodicals seem aware of the psychological principle here exposed it is known to every newspaper publisher of the slightest professional intelligence all successful newspapers are ceaselessly querulous and bellicose they never defend anyone or anything if they can help it if the job is forced upon them they tackle it by denouncing someone or something else the plan never fails turn to the moving picture trade magazines the most prosperous of them is given over in the main to bitter attacks upon new films come back to daily journalism the new york tribune a decaying paper well-nigh rehabilitated itself by attacking hearst the cleverest muckraker of them all for a moment apparently dismayed he attempted a defense of himself and came near falling into actual disaster then recovering his old form he began a whole series of counter-attacks and cover-attacks and in six months he was safe and sound again end of chapter thirteen recording by linda johnson Chapter Fourteen of Prejudices, First Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prejudices, First Series by H. L. Mencken. The Ulster Polonius. A good half of the humor of the late Mark Twain consisted of admitting frankly the possession of vices and weaknesses that all of us have and few of us care to acknowledge practically all of the sagacity of george bernard shaw consists of bellowing vociferously what every one knows i think i am as well acquainted with his works both hortatory and dramatic as the next man i wrote the first book ever devoted to a discussion of them and i read them pretty steadily even today and with endless enjoyment yet so far as i know i have never found an original idea in them never a single statement of fact or opinion that was not anteriorly familiar and almost commonplace put the thesis of any of his plays into a plain proposition and i doubt that you could find a literate man in christendom who had not heard it before or who would seriously dispute it the roots of each one of them are in platitude the roots of every effective stage play are in platitude that a dramatist is inevitably a platitudinarian is itself a platitude double damned but shaw clings to the obvious even when he is not hampered by the suffocating conventions of the stage his fabian tracts and his pamphlets on the war are veritable compendiums of the undeniable what is seriously stated in them is quite beyond logical dispute they have excited a great deal of ire they have brought down upon him a great deal of amusing abuse but i have yet to hear of any one actually controverting them as well try to controvert the copernican astronomy they are as bulletproof in essence as the multiplication table and vastly more bulletproof than the ten commandments or the constitution of the united states well then why does the ulsterman kick up such a pother why is he regarded as an arch heretic almost comparable to galileo nietzsche or simon magnus for the simplest of reasons because he practices with great zest and skill the fine art of exhibiting the obvious in unexpected and terrifying lights because he is a master of the logical trick of so matching two apparently safe premises that they yield an incongruous and inconvenient conclusion above all because he is a fellow of the utmost charm and address quick-witted bold limber-tongued persuasive humorous iconoclastic ingratiating in brief an irishman and so the exact antithesis of the solemn sassenachs who ordinarily instruct and exhort us 
turn to his man and superman and you will see the whole shaw machine at work what he starts out with is the self-evident fact disputed by no one not idiotic that a woman has vastly more to gain by marriage under christian monogamy than a man that fact is as old as monogamy itself it was i dare say the admitted basis of the palace revolution which brought monogamy into the world but now comes shaw with an implication that the sentimentality of the world chooses to conceal with a deduction plainly resident in the original proposition but kept in safe silence there by a preposterous and hypocritical taboo to wit the deduction that women are well aware of the profit that marriage yields for them and that they are thus much more eager to marry than men are and ever alert to take the lead in the business this second fact to any man who has passed through the terrible years between twenty-five and forty is as plain as the first but by a sort of general consent it is not openly stated violate that general consent and you are guilty of scandalum magnatum shaw is simply one who is guilty of scandalum magnatum habitually a professional criminal in that department it is his life work to announce the obvious in terms of the scandalous what lies under the horror of such blabbing is the deepest and most widespread of human weaknesses which is to say intellectual cowardice the craven appetite for mental ease and security the fear of thinking things out all men are afflicted by it more or less not even the most courageous and frank of men likes to admit in specific terms that his wife is fat or that she seduced him to the altar by a transparent trick or that their joint progeny resemble her brother or father and are thus cads a few extraordinary heroes of logic and evidence may do it occasionally but only occasionally the average man never does it at all he is eternally in fear of what he knows in his heart his whole life is made up of efforts to dodge it and conceal it he is always running away from what passes for his intelligence and taking refuge in what pass for his higher feelings i e his stupidities his delusions his sentimentalities shaw is devoted to the art of hauling this recreant fellow up he is one who for purposes of sensation often for the mere joy of outraging the tender-minded resolutely and mercilessly thinks things out sometimes with the utmost ingenuity and humor but often it must be said in the same muddled way that the average right thinker would do it if he ever got up the courage remember this formula and all of the fellow's alleged originality becomes no more than a sort of bad boy audacity usually in bad taste he drags skeletons from their closet and makes them dance obscenely but everyone of course knew that they were there all the while he would produce an excitement of exactly the same kind though perhaps superior in intensity if he should walk down the strand bared to the waist and so remind the shocked londoners of the unquestioned fact though conventionally concealed and forgotten that he is a mammal and has an umbilicus turn to a typical play and preface of his later canon say androcles and the lion here the complete shaw formula is exposed on the one hand there is a mass of platitudes on the other hand there is the air of a peep show on the one hand he rehearses facts so stale that even methodist clergymen have probably heard of them on the other hand he states them so scandalously that the pious get all of the thrills out of the business that would accompany a view of the rector in liquor in the pulpit here for example are some of his contentions a that the social and economic doctrines preached by jesus were indistinguishable from what is now called socialism b that the pauline transcendentalism visible in the acts and the epistles 
differs enormously from the simple humanitarianism set forth in the four gospels c that the christianity on tap today would be almost as abhorrent to jesus supposing him returned to earth as the theories of nietzsche hindenburg or clemenceau and vastly more abhorrent than those of emma goldman d that the rejection of the biblical miracles and even of the historical credibility of the gospels by no means disposes of christ himself e that the early christians were persecuted not because their theology was regarded as unsound but because their public conduct constituted a nuisance it is unnecessary to go on could any one imagine a more abject surrender to the undeniable would it be possible to reduce the german exegesis of a century and a half to a more depressing series of platitudes but his discussion of the inconsistencies between the four gospels is even worse you will find all of its points set forth in any elemental treatise upon new testament criticism even in so childish a tract as ramsden balmforth's he actually dishes up with a heavy air of profundity the news that there is a glaring conflict between the genealogy of jesus in matthew i one seventeen and the direct claim of divine paternity in matthew i eighteen more he breaks out with the astounding discovery that jesus was a good jew and that paul's repudiation of circumcision now a cardinal article of the so-called christian faith would have surprised him and perhaps greatly shocked him the whole preface running to one hundred fourteen pages is made up of just such shop-worn stuff searching it from end to end with eagle eye i have failed to find a single fact or argument that was not previously familiar to me despite the circumstance that i ordinarily give little attention to the sacred sciences and thus might have been expected to be surprised by their veriest commonplaces nevertheless this preface makes bouncing reading and therein lies the secret of the continued vogue of shaw he has a large and extremely uncommon capacity for provocative utterance he knows how to get a touch of bellicosity into the most banal of doctrines he is forever on tiptoe forever challenging forever sforzando his matter may be from the public store even from the public junk shop but his manner is always all his own the tune is old but the words are new consider for example his discussion of the personality of jesus the idea is simple and obvious jesus was not a long-faced prophet of evil like john the baptist nor was he an ascetic or a mystic but here is the shaw way of saying it quote, he was what we call an artist and a bohemian in his manner of life unquote. the fact remains unchanged but in the extravagant statement of it there is a shock for those who have been confusing the sour donkey they hear of a sunday with the tolerant likable man they profess to worship and perhaps there is even a genial snicker in it for their betters so with his treatment of the atonement his objections to it are time-worn but suddenly he gets the effect of novelty by pointing out the quite manifest fact that acceptance of it is apt to make for weakness that the man who rejects it is thrown back upon his own courage and circumspection and is hence stimulated to augment them the first argument that jesus was of free and easy habits is so commonplace that i have heard it voiced by a bishop the second suggests itself so naturally that i myself once employed it against a chance christian encountered in a pullman smoking-room this christian was at first shocked as he might have been by reading shaw but in half an hour he was confessing that he had long ago thought of the objection himself and put it away as immoral i well remember his fascinated interest as i showed him how my inability to accept the doctrine put a heavy burden of moral responsibility upon me 
and forced me to be more watchful of my conduct than the elect of god and so robbed me of many pleasant advantages in finance the dialectic and amour a double jest conceals itself in the shaw legend the first half of it i have already disclosed the second half has to do with the fact that shaw is not at all the wholesale agnostic his fascinated victims see him but an orthodox scotch presbyterian of the most cocksure and bilious sort in fact almost the archetype of the blue nose in the theory that he is irish i take little stock his very name is as scotch as haggis and the part of ireland from which he springs is peopled almost exclusively by scots the true irishman is a romantic he senses life as a mystery a thing of wonder an experience of passion and beauty in politics he is not logical but emotional in religion his interest centers not in the commandments but in the sacraments the scot on the contrary is almost devoid of romanticism he is a materialist a logician a utilitarian life to him is not a poem but a series of police regulations god is not an indulgent father but a hanging judge there are no saints but only devils beauty is a lewdness redeemable only in the service of morality it is more important to get on in the world than to be brushed by angels wings here shaw runs exactly true to type read his critical writings from end to end and you will not find the slightest hint that objects of art were passing before him as he wrote he founded in england the superstition that ibsen was no more than a tin-pot evangelist a sort of brother to general booth mrs pankhurst and the syndics of the sex hygiene society he turned shakespeare into a bird of evil croaking dismally in a rain barrel he even injected a moral content by dint of herculean straining into the musical dramas of richard wagner surely the most colossal sacrifices of moral ideas ever made on the altar of beauty always the ethical obsession the hallmark of the scotch puritan is visible in him his politics is mere moral indignation his aesthetic theory is cannibalism upon aesthetics and in his general writing he is forever discovering an atrocity in what was hitherto passed as no more than a human weakness he is forever inventing new sins and demanding their punishment he always sees his opponent not only as wrong but also as a scoundrel i have called him a presbyterian need i add that he flirts with predestination under the quasi-scientific nom de guerre of determinism that he seems to be convinced that while men may not be responsible for their virtues they are undoubtedly responsible for their offendings and deserve to be clubbed therefore and this is shaw the revolutionist the heretic next perhaps we shall be hearing of benedict the fifteenth the atheist end of chapter fourteen recording by linda johnson chapter fifteen of prejudices first series this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Prejudices, First Series, by H. L. Mencken, Chapter 15. An Unheeded Lawgiver. One discerns, in all right-thinking American criticism, the doctrine that Ralph Waldo Emerson was a great man, but the specifications supporting that doctrine are seldom displayed with any clarity 
despite the vast mass of writing about him he remains to be worked out critically practically all the existing criticism of him is marked by his own mellifluous obscurity perhaps a good deal of this obscurity is due to contradictions inherent in the man's character he was dualism ambulant what he actually was was seldom identical with what he represented himself to be or what his admirers thought him to be universally greeted in his own day as a revolutionary he was in point of fact imitative and cautious an importer of stale german elixirs sometimes direct and sometimes through the carlylean branch house who took good care to dilute them with buttermilk before merchanting them the theoretical spokesman all his life long of bold and forthright thinking of the unafraid statement of ideas he stated his own so warily and so muggily that they were ratified on the one hand by nietzsche and on the other hand by the messiahs of the new thought that lavender buncombe what one notices about him chiefly is his lack of influence upon the main stream of american thought such as it is he had admirers and even worshippers but no apprentices nietzscheism and the new thought are alike tremendous violations of orthodox american doctrine the one makes a headlong attack upon egalitarianism the cornerstone of american politics the other substitutes mysticism which is the notion that the true realities are all concealed for the prevailing american notion that the only true realities lie upon the surface and are easily discerned by congressmen newspaper editorial writers and members of the junior order of united american mechanics the emerson cult in america has been an affectation from the start not many of the chautauqua orators literary professors vassarized old maids and other such bogus intelligentsia who devote themselves to it have any intelligible understanding of the transcendentalism at the heart of it and not one of them so far as i can make out has ever executed emerson's command to defer never to the popular cry on the contrary it is precisely within the circle of emersonian adulation that one finds the greatest tendency to test all ideas by their respectability to combat free thought as something intrinsically vicious and to yield placidly to some great decorum some fetish of a government some ephemeral trade or war or man it is surely not unworthy of notice that the country of this prophet of man thinking is precisely the country in which every sort of dissident from the current pishposh is combated most ferociously and in which there is the most vigorous existing tendency to suppress free speech altogether thus emerson on the side of ideas has left but faint tracks behind him his quest was for facts amidst appearances and his whole metaphysic revolved around a doctrine of transcendental first causes a conception of interior and immutable realities distinct from and superior to mere transient phenomena but the philosophy that actually prevails among his countrymen a philosophy put into caressing terms by william james teaches an almost exactly contrary doctrine its central idea is that whatever satisfies the immediate need is substantially true 
that appearance is the only form of fact worthy the consideration of a man with money in the bank and the old flag floating over him and hair on his chest nor has emerson had any ponderable influence as a literary artist in the technical sense or as the prophet of a culture that is at home despite the feeble imitations of campus critics his manner has vanished with his matter there is in the true sense no emersonian school of american writers current american writing with its cocksureness its somewhat hard competence its air of selling goods of utterly at war with his loose impressionistic method his often mystifying groping for ideas his relentless pursuit of phrases in the same way one searches the country in vain for any general reaction to the cultural ideal that he set up when one casts about for salient men whom he moved profoundly men who got light from his torch one thinks first and last not of americans but of such men as nietzsche and hermann grimm the germans and tyndall and matthew arnold the englishman what remains of him at home as i have said is no more than on the one hand a somewhat absurd affectation of intellectual fastidiousness now almost extinct even in new england and on the other hand a debased transcendentalism rolled into pills for fat women with vague pains and inattentive husbands in brief the new thought in brief imbecility this new thought a decadent end product of american superficiality now almost monopolizes him one hears of him in its preposterous literature and one hears of him in textbooks for the young but not often elsewhere allowing everything it would surely be absurd to hold that he has colored and conditioned the main stream of american thought as goethe colored and conditioned the thought of germany or pushkin that of russia or voltaire that of france End of chapter 15